thank you to everybody for joining tonight. It's exciting to have uh, folks online and to provide this resource to uh, patients and other providers uh, to come and look and to gain some knowledge. Um, as Desiree mentioned, this is our way of providing a little bit more education to your diagnosis in a casual setting. Um, so feel free to use this as such. Um, if there are any questions, please feel free to uh, uh, send Desiree a message and she can interrupt or if your microphone's off and you want to interrupt, please do so. Uh, but tonight we're going to be talking about hip preservation, um, which is essentially the saving of your original hip and trying to maintain your original hip and doing this through the surgical method of hip arthroscopy. Um, I grew up in Wisconsin. I did uh, my undergrad in uh, physical therapy and worked as a physical therapist for a few years. So I have a, a good understanding of the uh, rehab and uh, the post-operative uh, care as well as the surgical care. I did my uh, residency in, well, I did med school at Case Western in Cleveland as well as my orthopedic surgery residency and then did my uh, fellowship training, which is an extra year training in uh, sports medicine, arthroscopy and reconstructive surgery in Los Angeles at uh, Southern California Orthopedic Institute. Um, we have a amazing team um, in our orthopedic and sports medicine department. Um, we have multiple offices for all of your needs. Um, we also have uh, Today's Care Plus, which is an after hours care that can take care of uh, your orthopedic needs and triage those appropriately. So feel free to reach out to us at any of our locations and we uh, pride ourselves on getting you in as quickly as you need to be. So with that being said, there's no real disclosures for this talk. So we're gonna discuss how we try to preserve your hip through arthroscopy. And before we get into the nitty gritty details of all that, I just wanna review a little bit about arthroscopy. And this becomes important when we talk about hip arthroscopy. So hip arthroscopy has not been around for that long. Um, in general, arthroscopy has been prominent in other joints since the 1960s. And the first joint to really employ its use primarily is the knee. And the reason that is, is because it's a very superficial joint. So access to the joint is relatively easy and doesn't require much special instrumentation or training. Versus with the hip, it's been probably over the last 10, 15, 20, well, 10 to 15 years that it really has become prominent. And, uh, hip arthroscopy has been one of the fastest growing procedures, although there still are not a lot of people that do high volume hip arthroscopies. That's important because getting access to this joint in particular, which is very deep seated in the pelvis region, it has a very limited uh, mobility and maneuverability. So it requires special instrumentation, special training and special apparatus to safely get into the joint and treat the conditions that we wanna treat. So uh, with that being said, our goal is to try to preserve your hip. So we talk about trying to prevent hip replacements and in a way that is kind of what we're trying to do. And I'll explain that a little bit as we go. And this really started from that study down in your bottom left. So this was a, a seminal paper by Dr. Gans who explained that uh, most of the advanced hip arthritis that he saw was related to conditions such as hip impingement and dysplasia. And so through the use of hip arthroscopy, and if we can catch these situations soon enough, we can change the anatomy of the hip a bit and hopefully prolong you having your hip or keeping it forever. So when we talk about hip pain, um, there is a lot that goes into kind of figuring this out and an extensive amount of kind of some time in the clinic and exam findings because the hip is connected to a lot of different areas. So obviously you have the knee below, but in the pelvis, there are a lot of internal structures as well as a lot of muscles. You have your SI joint, you have back pain, you have bursitis areas. So as you can see, just from the anatomy, there's a ton of different things that can cause hip and groin pain. And this is just a litany of those things from things in front of the hip to the side of the hip to the back of the hip and around those hips and things that aren't even related to orthopedics such as intra-abdominal problems or gynecological problems, kidney problems. So all those things have to go kind of come into play when we're trying to figure out where your pain is coming from. So 
if we're going to consider hip arthroscopy, we want to make sure that we're working on the correct area. So what are the top things that I tend to look at in the clinic, or sometimes we have to say, well, it actually isn't coming from your hip, it's coming from somewhere else. So the typical thing is back pain. Um, a lot of folks think that pain in the buttocks or even the side of the hip is the actual hip joint. Um, if you look at that anatomy, or we call that anatomy, the ball in the socket is actually more centered right deep to your groin. So classic groin pain tends to be from the hip. Right side or low back pain, buttocks pain tends to be coming from the back. So if patients put their hand on their buttocks or in their low back, that may be an indicator that the pain is coming from the back or radiating to the hip. Um, there are other things inside the pelvis, whether it be OBGYN issues or sports hernia issues or true hernia issues. And then there's lateral hip pain where you have some bursitis or you have an abductor tendon tear or you have some snapping hip syndrome. So all of these things kind of come into play when we're trying to figure out what's going on. So if we've narrowed it down and we've ruled out back pathology or knee pathology or intra-abdominal stuff, and we're talking strictly about the hip, then we're trying to figure out what inside the hip or around the hip is causing your pain. So the typical things that we're gonna spend most of our time on, because this is what we deal with primarily when we talk about hip arthroscopy, is femoral acetabular impingement, or you may have heard the term FAI, which stands for femoral acetabular impingement. That can lead to tearing of the labrum, which is, we'll show some pictures later, but a little gasket that kind of sits on the edge of the cup. Other things that can be a problem are chondral injuries. Advanced chondral injuries is essentially arthritis, and that's where those chondral surfaces, the cartilage surfaces, wear away. Sometimes there are conditions called synovial chondromatosis, where you get all these little loose pieces in the joint that can be removed arthroscopically. But with the advent of the hip scope, we can get in there and treat some things that would normally have had to be treated with an open procedure and dislocating the hip. Some of the things around the joint that we do treat with the hip scope as well can be basically bursitis around that greater troche region or even hip abductor tendon tears, which we consider as the rotator cuff of the hip. Sometimes we can repair small ones like that through the hip scope, uh, snapping hip, or sometimes even issues around the sciatic nerve. So when you consider those being the symptoms, who is most at risk for some of these type of issues? It doesn't always require a big injury. It can be an overuse phenomenon. Um, sometimes people have abnormal anatomy, which we're gonna show where they're, the ball is not round, it's more egg shaped, and that can cause pressure on the labrum and cause impingement. Sometimes their anatomy is normal, and you may be somebody that has activities that employ abnormal motion, such as dancing or gymnastics, and that can lead to pinching of the labrum and tearing and impingement and cartilage issues. This is an older study, but it's important to note because it's still kind of true today. It's not quite as bad, but in the past when hip arthroscopy wasn't done a lot, it usually took about three different providers to get to the right person that actually does hip arthroscopy. And usually I find that to be one or two, and I'll get referrals from other orthopedists who don't do hip arthroscopy, but because it has become more prominent over the last decade, that has definitely shortened up. But not every orthopedist is going to specialize in hip arthroscopy or not every sports orthopedist is going to. So it can take some time to get the appropriate diagnosis or find the right person. So if you consider yourself to have hip pain and you're thinking about what might be going on, what's the typical presentation? So when we talk about that, you'll, you may have even heard about it as a C-shaped sign. So the patient, you may grab your hip in this manner and it kind of indicates pain deep inside the hip. It's not superficial. You can't touch it on the surface necessarily. It's kind of centered right where that ball and socket might be. And it's again, classically in the groin. It's not typically radiating to the toes or giving you tingling or numbness, not typically in the buttocks or the low back. It is really that classic C sign. You may have a history of trauma, or you just may have a history of repetitive squatting, crawling, and you may not even have any real indication of how it occurred. It just may occur over time. And that may be related to your anatomy, which we'll talk about when we look at some x-rays. You may have some mechanical symptoms, such as clicking and popping and snapping, which can be an indication of labral pathology. 
You don't have to have this classic Bo Jackson hip dislocation, but dislocating the hip can lead to chondral injuries or early arthritis and tearing of the labrum. So sometimes that is an indication for hip arthroscopy as well as they recover from that type of injury. Often you'll have some limitations in motion. So flexing the hip, which is bringing your knee towards your chest or rotating the hip in, um, which is actually turning your foot out. And those are some of the maneuvers that I'll do in clinic to try to figure out where the pain is coming from. You may describe pinching in the groin. Um, a lot of times patients with problems inside the hip joint will describe pain with prolonged sitting. It will be difficult to get in and out of a car because it requires rotation. Typically, if those things don't hurt them, but it hurts more to walk in a straight line and after a prolonged period of time, or it hurts um, for a while after you get up from a stationary position, sometimes that can be a sign of just arthritis of the hip. And so we'll go over that as well. So examination. So you have some hip pain, you come into the clinic, what are we going to look at? So first we'll do a complete exam and we'll start by just watching you walk in. Um, there are certain kind of lurches or gait patterns that can happen or walking patterns that can happen. And a lot of times if you find yourself leaning to that side, that can be an indication that there might be some chondral issues or some pressure issues in the hip. And it, it may be more a sign of arthritis, um, which again, we'll go over, but those are things we start with. There's a whole series of things that we'll go through. The most common are pictured here. A log roll, a simple rolling of the leg in and out, and particularly pushing it all the way in, is a very classic sign for intraarticular or ball and socket hip problems. We're gonna also talk about this impingement test where we internally rotate the hip to see if we can elicit groin pain. But you can see that we look at flexibility, we look at motor control, we palpate different things to see if they're tender to the touch. And then of course we rule out all those other things that could cause or mimic hip pain. So this is the impingement test. And this is the classic test to see if something's impinging in terms of that femoral acetabular impingement, or if that labrum may be irritated or torn. So you'll be on your back and I'll grab the leg, I'll rotate the foot out and I'll push your knee across your body and kind of up towards your opposite shoulder. And this picture down here shows a normal hip with a nice round ball. This one shows a little bit of a bump. And you can see that if you internally rotate and push that up, it's gonna bang against that labrum and against the rim. And that's what gives you the impingement. And then the labrum is the innocent bystander that's getting squished between the two and ends up tearing. So that's the classic uh, test for impingement syndrome. And again, some of those other peripheral things we talked about, sometimes people have a snapping hip where their hip flexor tendon rolls over a little bony ridge. And it, this is classically something that you can hear. So you kind of feel that thud and it's very loud and you may be even able to audibly hear it somebody next to you. There's also a snapping hip that can come from the side. And if anybody's ever had this, this is definitely something that you can see. It looks like their hip is dislocating, which it obviously isn't, but it is a very kind of prominent snapping of the IT band over the greater trochanter. And so there's, are, again, all things that we look at, as well as sports hernia or athletic pubalgia, and that's more centralized groin pain or ab lower abdominal pain, not necessarily the classic groin pain on the right or the left. But again, all things we have to take into account um, greater trochanteric bursitis or hip abductor tendon tears sometimes go along with pain that's being generated from inside the hip. So if you have a recalcitrant or a pain that just won't go away on the side of your hip, it may actually be caused by what's going on inside the hip. So sometimes people come in and they've had bursal injections and they just aren't getting better. And we find that they have impingement and a labral tear, which is making the lateral symptoms worse. So we, again, look into all that. So if you've come into the clinic and we're talking about hip pain and we're worried about something inside the hip, we're gonna get some x-rays. And there's some special x-rays that we like to get if we talk about hip arthroscopy. So the first one is just a weight-bearing or sometimes a non-weight-bearing AP pelvis. And so we're looking at your pelvis from the front and the things we're looking at are the shape of the cup and the shape of the ball. 
Oftentimes, the shape of the ball looks relatively normal on this view, but not on other views, which we'll show you. And this is why if you go to an emergency room or a general orthopedist, if you get the typical hip x-rays, some of the changes that you see down here on the femoral neck may not show up. The most important thing with this thing, with this x-ray we're looking for is any advanced arthritis. Because if you have arthritis in the hip, that is a contraindication, or if you have significant arthritis in the hip, that's a contraindication to a hip arthroscopy, meaning we're not gonna be able to change the arthritis. And we'll talk more about that in a second. The other ones we look at are called false profile views. So these are also standing. So on this picture on your left of the screen where my cursor is, we're looking at the front of the rim to make sure that there's not a little bony projection that can hang down that might need to be shaved down. And then we look at both sides for comparison, regardless of uh, whether you have pain on one or both sides. The most important x-ray that we do to look for the cause of impingement is this view with your legs up in the air and slightly rotated. It's called the 45 degree done lateral. And you can see on this particular patient, there is a bump that is fairly significant here on the femoral neck. So we like to see this light bulb appearance where the ball is round and you see the bottom scooped out and we wanna see the top scooped out like that as well. And on this right hip that I'm indicating on, it's the left on the screen, but they're facing us, the right hips here, you can see a little fleck of bone on the rim. And that means that's a great indication that this is banging into the rim. And what you can't see here is the labrum and that's what's being torn. So this is classic femoral acetabular impingement. And even without an MRI, I can tell you that the labrum is torn. And interestingly enough, there was a study that just came out this month that looks at the utilities of MRIs in people that have classic impingement on their x-rays. And it's trying to promote the MRI not necessarily being useful. And what I tell patients is that often the insurance companies want an MRI because they want a diagnosis of a labral tear, but it also rules out some other pathology that you might not find on exam or uh, x-ray. But in these classic FAI appearances where they have this lesion called the cam lesion on the femoral neck, we know that the labrum is going to be torn and we know what we have to do arthroscopically regardless of the MRI. So this is that done lateral looking at one view and the bottom pictures of the model show the bump but if you took an x-ray just from the front, that bump would kind of sit in front and you, it wouldn't be tangential or in line with the x-ray beam, so you wouldn't see it. So when you rotate the leg up, you can then see the bump. So it's important to have these special x-rays to know what I need to do arthroscopically and where I need to shave down. So this is called, and you might see it if you get into your uh, kind of authorization for surgery, it's called the alpha angle and insurance companies have kind of keyed into this and they wanna see that measured and they wanna see that it's typically greater than 50 degrees. And that's just a simple angle measurement from the x-ray showing that there's a bump here and it's basically measured by where that bump starts because we want the ball to be perfectly spherical. So everything out of here would need to be shaved down to prevent that labrum from re-tearing. The other thing that's important for these early x-rays are the shape of the cup. And another no-go or contraindication to hip arthroscopy is somebody with a severely dysplastic acetabulum, meaning the cup is not deeply shaped, but it's very shallow, almost like a dinner plate. And that makes the hip unstable. That is not something that we can take care of arthroscopically. And if the patient is young and healthy and has good cartilage and not arthritis, then we talk about a surgery where we correct the shape of the cup through an open procedure called the periacetabular osteotomy or PAO. But we look closely at that. And fortunately, most patients don't have that much dysplasia, but we wanna make sure that there's enough coverage and we wanna make sure that we can keep them from becoming unstable. On the opposite end of the spectrum, Your you can Fortune. see patients, yes. Mm -hmm. Um, we've I got, can. just real quick, uh, uh, we've got someone that would like to ask a question. I believe Tiffany's got her hand raised here. Sure. And Tiffany, if you unmute there, you can ask your question. Hi there. Hi. Um, I am 50 years old and at the age of 45, I actually had a labial tear and impingement in my right hip. 
I did end up having surgery. And I also, they corrected the head of the femur um, because it was kind of misshapen so that it would fit in the socket better. Um, and I've been doing good for a few years. And now I'm noticing that that snapping is coming back. Um, and they said that I had it bilaterally. Um, and I'm starting to feel it in the left side as well. Is that something that's typical that you see? Yes, there's actually a study that we did when I was in a residency where we looked at human skeletons and we had a big collection called the Heyman Todd Collection at the Cleveland Natural Museum of History. And we looked at 3000 cadaver or skeletons and we found that there were bilateral signs of impingement in 80% of the people. So a lot of the times, if it's on one side, or at least the shape of the ball is a little misshapen on one side, it's 80% of the time, it's probably going to be that way on the other side. Um, as we, and I'll talk about this a little bit later on, but as you get a little bit more mature in age, we have to be very careful that you don't have a lot of arthritis in the hip. And so we'll critically analyze the x-rays, we'll critically analyze the MRI, we'll see kind of what your motion is like and see how your pain generates because if we get in there and we find a lot of arthritis, we can't change the arthritis. There is no way that we can put cartilage back on once it's worn away. We can clean it up. We can get rid of some of the fluid that's accumulated. We can get rid of little pieces of floating cartilage. Sometimes you can scrape the bone or puncture holes in the bone and it will create a little kind of scar tissue clot over the top. If it's a very focal lesion of cartilage, sometimes there's, and I'll show you down the road here, there's little kind of auto or allograft cartilage procedures that we can put some donor cartilage in there and it might create some type of barrier. But if you have advanced arthritis, that's an indication for a hip replacement. But if you were 45 and they screened you for arthritis and you did well, then you can have some still progression of arthritis if it was already brewing, um, but hopefully it preserves your hip for a while. Um, but certainly to your question of it being on the opposite side, that can certainly be the case. Thank you very much. You're welcome. So if there's any other questions, we can certainly answer them now. If not, um, there'll be plenty of time throughout. And if anything sparks your interest, please feel free to reach out to Desiree or raise your hand. Um, the picture on the right side of your screen is over coverage. So we talked about dysplasia being under coverage, but over coverage in general, we term this the pincer lesion. So this is a exaggerated exam, but you can see how the cup really extends all the way over. And this is almost what we term a captured hip. Um, so it has all this excessive bone. And if we get down to the nitty gritty of it, this is probably a calcified labrum that's made the rim extend that far. And the, this picture would not be a good candidate for a hip scope just because there's a lot of arthritic changes already here. But it is a picture of over coverage and it is a picture of some decent arthritis. So if the x-rays are pertinent, the exam's pertinent, and we feel that you have impingement and likely a labral tear, like I talked about, nowadays we get MRIs, okay? Down the road, maybe we won't have to, um, but Classically, we'll get MRIs, and just to make sure we see everything we want to see, we'll probably have them inject a dye solution into the hip, which will kind of turn on the light bulb in the hip and really make it easier for us to see things. Um, if it is a high quality MRI scanner, sometimes we don't need the dye injected, but often we do. Because what we want to see is that white dye that shows up in MRI, we want it to seep into the tear and it just shows it. Because this is not a functional MRI, nobody's moving, the patient is stationary, you the patient are stationary. So on this left picture, you can see a normal labrum and the labrum is this dark black triangle. And the light gray structure here between the, the socket and the ball is your articular cartilage. And that's beautiful articular cartilage. It's nice and thick. There's no white lines or cracks in it. If you look over here, you can see the white line extending from the, between the labrum and the bone. So that's a fairly classic look of a labral tear. And it's never really that impressive on MRI, even this tear. What's more impressive are the x-ray findings with 
whether there's a bump on the femoral neck and femoral head, and that's causing impingement. So the MRIs at this point we still get, but in the future we may not need to always get. Once in a while we get a CT scan. Um, we try to use this very judiciously because there is a little radiation with CT exposure. Um, in my practice, I use it primarily if there's some really abnormal anatomy or if they've come to me and have already had a hip scope and they're still having problems because the number one cause for revision hip arthroscopy is not resecting the cam appropriately. So, or that bump on the femoral neck. So this is a picture of uh, somebody where they took down, you can see the cam, you can see the resection, and then you can see how it looks on CT scan. But for routine hip arthroscopy, a CT scan is usually not necessary. So now if we've made this diagnosis and we say you have femoral acetabular impingement and even a labral tear, what are we gonna do? So we're gonna talk about treatment. And inside of orthopedics, we always try, and inside of everything, if you can treat it without surgery, we wanna to try to do that. So we always try non-operative care, um, even if you have a small labral tear. Labral tears, like the meniscus in the knee or the labrum in the shoulder, tend to tear with age anyway. So it is a process of aging and use. So not every labral tear has to have surgery or won't get better without surgery. So relative rest, changing your activity levels for a while to see if it can calm down. Basic medication like anti-inflammatory medications if you're safe to take those. Physical therapy, sometimes there's anatomy changes like your pelvis tilts forward, which can lead to more pinching. So if the therapist can get your lower abdominal muscle stronger and your gluteus maximus muscle stronger and stretch out your hip flexors, maybe just rebalancing your pelvis will help get rid of the pain. Um, and then if you feel like the pain is not significant enough and you ignore it and you're fine with it and you adjust your activities, that is also a potential in certain situations. Um, the Patients that are more at risk though to go on to those arthritic changes are the ones with the abnormal anatomy on x-ray. So certainly having surgery is gonna be ultimately up to you, but if you have that much abnormal anatomy on the ball and the socket and you're pinching all the time, that hip will likely go on to some arthritic changes. Can the last non-operative measure, which is a little bit more invasive, is injection therapy. And we'll talk about that in the next slide, but that's injecting a, a medicine, sometimes just numbing medication, sometimes cortisone into the hip to see if you get relief. And then, of course, on the operative side, hip arthroscopy is what we're talking about today. But sometimes there is a need for an open hip surgery. And usually that's reserved for these patients that have dysplasia, they don't have osteoarthritis and the cup needs to be reshaped. And again, that's called a PAO. So intraarticular hip injections, um, these are sometimes used for diagnostic techniques as well. So if your exam's a little equivocal, we're not exactly sure where the pain's coming from, we may use injections to see if we can kind of numb up that area or calm down that area. And if your pain goes away, then we know that that's where the issue is coming from. So there are studies that show that if you have a positive test for an intraarticular hip injection, it's 90% accuracy in determining your, basically that the problem is there. So if you get better and your pain goes away from this injection, we're almost certain that that's where the pain is coming from. And those people tend to do well then, of course, when we correct things in the hip, like the impingement or the labral tear. Sometimes though we use injections to rule out other parts. So if we're thinking that you might have bursitis on the side of the hip, we might give you a greater troke injection. Or if you have some back pain, we might do some spinal injections through pain management or an SI joint injection. So we can use these to help diagnose as well as to treat. So now we've gotten to the point where we've ruled everything else out. We have femoral acetabular impingement and a labral tear. We don't have any bad dysplasia or arthritis. And we're gonna talk about hip arthroscopy as the surgical treatment. So the primary indications are, like I said, the impingement and the labral tearing. Sometimes patients come in and I've had a handful of these where they have that synovial chondromatosis and they have those, all those little pellet-like structures in your hip and we can take those out arthroscopically. And that's, that's a big win because otherwise you would have to open up the hip and start removing those. So we can do it all through these little tiny incisions. 
um, loose bodies. I had a uh, young active male who had an injury that resulted in part of the femoral head falling off into the joint. And we were able to extract that because it was a non weight bearing portion arthroscopically and we didn't have to open the hip up. So there are some other things besides the impingement and the labral tearing that can be dealt with arthroscopically. Certainly things like advanced hip arthritis and hip dysplasia, which we talked about, are not indications for hip arthroscopy. And then of course, your general things that would keep you from having any surgery. If you have infections or local wound issues, um, sometimes body habitus is an issue, but not often, and then systemic illnesses. So not to harp on the arthritis all the time here, but this is an important thing in dictating if you are indicated for hip arthroscopy. So it should be very clear that any advanced arthritis is not indicated for hip arthroscopy because it's not gonna help you. And so ultimately, if you're the right age, you would go on and have a hip replacement. So this picture of the pelvis without the hip replacement shows a hip where the joint space is 1.5 millimeters. And on the other side, it's pretty normal at 5.3, but this, right hip facing us um, is not indicated for hip arthroscopy because it has advanced hip arthritis. And if you look closely, there's a lucency here in the acetabulum, which is a subchondral cyst, which is just another x-ray sign of advancing arthritis. So that person would fail a hip arthroscopy because we would get in there and find a bunch of cartilage damage, which we really can't change. And they would go on to likely needing a hip replacement within the next year or two, regardless. Um, hopefully they're at an age where a hip replacement is a good option. And then certainly here you can see advanced bone on bone changes. So that's an easy answer. That's a hip replacement as opposed to a hip arthroscopy. The other thing is dysplasia. So that's something that if you're considering hip arthroscopy that needs to be looked at. Basically a normal angle, and we measure these on the x-rays we get, is between 25 and 39 borderline dysplasia where it's a little shallow cup, we can still treat it arthroscopically in the right hands where we take care to close the capsule and make sure everything's tight on our way out. But if you are truly dysplastic and that cup is super shallow, that is not an indication for hip arthroscopy. And then on the far end, if it's a pincer lesion, that can be an indication for taking down some of the rim and shaving this down and reattaching the labrum. <clears throat> Dr. 14? Uh, yes. Claire has a question, um, and I'll let her go ahead and unmute there. Um, hey, Dr. Fortune. Hi, Claire. On that last slide, hi. Um, on that last slide, was that the alpha angle, or is this a different angle? So this is called the lateral center edge angle, which is okay. basically from the center of your femoral head to the edge of the acetabulum taken on a AP x-ray. And that measures the, what the cup shape is like. The alpha angle measures the bump on the femoral neck. So okay, opposite it, side of the hip. Cause it was like that perfect circle and they were looking at how far. Okay, that makes yeah. sense. And yeah. would you- The have, alpha would angle you have, is the can, the can lesion. Yeah. Okay, and would, would you have taken any notes on this? Like on our, I guess, post-op papers or would that be not something you'd measure during uh, the surgery? So when we, so we don't measure them during surgery, but before surgery, we do measure them. So um, as I prepare for surgery and when we talk with the initial x-rays, I'll look at the cup. If it's a normal shape, we may not get an exact measurement, but if I think it's borderline or close, I will measure this angle and then we'll talk about that. Um, certainly if you're dysplastic, we would talk about some of the other options, but if you're borderline or normal, then the cup position isn't going to not allow you to have a hip arthroscopy. Um, and then that alpha angle, we generally measure um, either on an MRI or on that done lateral X-ray. And sometimes the insurance companies want an exact measurement, but if we see a big bump there, we may not give you an exact angle, but we know that there's a large bump and a large alpha angle. Okay. And I, the dysplasia thing never came up in any of my x-rays, so I'm guessing I don't need to worry about that right now. Correct. 
Correct. Yes. These are things that all, some of these things are in the background that we're looking at. And, um, and that's why these talks are good because it gives you an opportunity to kind of spend an hour here and go back and look at this video and kind of look at all these things and other patients, because there'll be patients that haven't had hip arthroscopy yet, haven't even been to see me or somebody else yet. Um, there are patients that have had their hip scope two years ago. Um, so that's exactly what this med school segment is about, is to just give you the opportunity to sit down in a reliable manner, because you can't always trust where you find things on the internet. And so this is a reliable source to kind of look at all this stuff. So if all those hoops have been uh, jumped through and all the indications have been met and we're ready to move on with hip arthroscopy, again, we talk about all these things. So these are kind of the check boxes that are either documented or written out or talked about or in just the back of our head. Have you failed non-surgical treatment? So have we tried to rest it, tried to do physical therapy, tried to do NSAIDs, maybe or maybe not an injection? Do you have the pain in the right area? Are we sure that it's coming from the hip and not from the back or somewhere else? And there is no specific age range, but generally the patients that do the best are the ones that don't have any arthritis and have kind of those abnormal mechanics of that bump on the femoral neck. We can take that down and we can fix the labrum. There have been a few patients that are in their 70s that have pristine cartilage better than somebody in their 20s with a labral tear and they do well as also. But it is very important for me to have discussions with uh, the patient as they approach 50, 60, 70, we have to be sure that there's really no arthritis in there. Um, and that's the, the contraindication if there were. So with that being said, our primary issue here are these abnormal mechanics or the impingement. So you can see a normal ball here in socket. You can see that cam lesion here and all that hash stuff is gonna to need to be resected. Oftentimes there's a little extra of both. There's a little bump here and maybe a little extra here, or it could be a normal ball and a little extra cup, okay? So this is a picture of a patient here looking at us. So this is his right side, this is his left. You can see that we've done the right side and resected that bump and made the ball round again. And then on the left side, you can see he still has a, a, a bump there. Um, he probably went on to have that left side done as well. Um, this is not my picture, but this is an open hip dislocation. And this just shows you what it would look like if you were looking at it with your own two eyes. So instead of the ball looking round, it is egg shaped. So arthroscopically, I would shave down all of this to make the ball round again. So again, a lot of this comes from that initial study where 80% or 90% of the patients that went on to have advanced arthritis had a bump on their femoral neck or they were dysplastic. And so we do feel that those patients have a higher chance of going on to develop hip arthritis and necessitate a hip replacement. So in a way, we are trying to prevent hip replacements down the road, whether that's 20, 30, 40, or 50 years. But again, here's that stat, 70, 90% of all the patients in that particular study that had hip arthritis was either caused by impingement or dysplasia. So um, it's a excellent tool if we can catch this soon enough to uh, hopefully prevent that from uh, happening. This is that study I mentioned where we looked at all those skeletal remains and found that it happened or these type of bumps, that cam lesion was present in 80% of the skeletons. So again, this is an arthroscopic picture looking at inside the hip. We can see the cup here and the ball here with no cartilage damage, but this is a delamination of the cartilage. And that's what happens when that big bump pushes on the labrum. The labrum is on the far right of the screen here but this cartilage is starting to delaminate. Once that delaminates, there's nothing you can do about it. Um, it is, you can kind of shave it down and smooth it out, but that's the extent of what you can do. So if we move on to the next slide, this is a picture of a uh, open hip procedure. And again, these are things that we don't have to deal with any longer because we can do these arthroscopically, but this is a cartilage flap that delaminated and this is the labrum. 
So this is a picture looking at what happens. So this is the bump and we can put a diagram to this. And as the hip rotates, it will bang into this blue labrum. And eventually, as it happens thousands and thousands of time, it will push into the cartilage. So you'll get impingement on the labrum. And then what will happen is eventually you will start to tear away the cartilage and delaminate the cartilage. And that's what leads to the arthritis. So it's important to get rid of this bump. The labrum, we of course want to fix, but the real key is getting rid of the bump. And if you fix the labrum without getting rid of the bump, you've really done yourself no good. So you've got to get rid of that bump. So going on to the other side of it, the pincer side of it, so that's an over coverage. Again, an open picture just to show you what it looks like. But this is a hip that has over coverage and you kind of see how it's banging into the, the rim here, but there's no big bump that's pushing on things. So it, arthroscopically, you can see that the labrum is kind of beat up here and a little bit frayed, but you don't have that same delamination once we back it up a little bit here. I'll show you the cup again. You don't have the same delamination where the cartilage is coming off, but you do see a little bit of damage on the backside and that's kind of called a counter coup lesion from that pincer kind of morphology. So this is just that other, another diagram. So showing a normal ball, so you don't have the pinch, but you get up because the rim is extending too far. It squishes the labrum and causes a little cartilage damage. And then it kind of fulcrums the head out and causes damage on the backside of the hip. So it still can lead to arthritis, but it's in a different mechanism. So the whole innocent bystander in all this is the labrum. So that's the fibrocartilaginous tissue. It's like columnar consistency, like the labrum in the shoulder or the meniscus in the knee. And on the hip, you can see it in this single view as the triangle on the edge. And it's meant to deepen the socket. It's meant to hold the joint fluid in place. It's meant to provide stability to the hip, act as a shock absorber and kind of distribute pressure. So this is a picture of inside the hip of the patient and we can see the labrum. It looks pretty good. There's a little bit of bruising here, but again, it does have the ability to heal because it does have a blood supply to it. Um, this is a picture of that other condition I showed you called synovial chondromatosis, where there's a bunch of little pebbles in there. Again, it's relatively rare, but it is a win when we can treat it arthroscopically because this is me pulling out a bunch of these and this is what it looks like on the table. There's just all these little pellets of bone, but we can get them typically almost all of them arthroscopically. So quickly before we finish it up, just <coughs> talking about arthroscopy itself. So you don't ever see this because you're asleep by this point. And generally you get a, uh, a general anesthetic. Um, we want the muscles. And we distract the hip enough to get access into the hip. Dr. Fortune. I'm not yeah. sure if it was just on my end, but it just kind of paused for a second there and I couldn't hear what you were saying, but could you just repeat that back, what you just said? Sure. So this is what it looks like. Once we get you on that special bed, we pull traction on the hip and it allows the ball. So this is a picture routinely taken in the operating room to distract from the hip itself. And that allows access or safe access to get inside the hip to do what we want to accomplish. So we use, we shoot for about a milli or a centimeter of distraction. We get into the hip stately with this spinal needle it's called, and then we cannulate over with these cannulas to get my camera and tools in there. And generally we work from two or three portal sites to get access. So after you're done with the surgery, um, you'll have a dressing on, but when the dressing comes off, you'll have a centimeter incision here, here and here typically, and it forms this triangle and that's the access point for this equipment to get in and do the work we need to do. So just to give you a few pictures from inside the hip, this is a left hip. We can see the ball, the socket and the labrum. Whoops, sorry, let me go back. And this is the capsule and you can see it's red and irritated. This is coming in, me coming in with the knife to open up the capsule so we can get in the hip safely and work. So this is how we cut through the capsule and this is called a beaver blade and it just opens up the capsule so we can safely get into the hip. 
And this is the capsule that will close at the end. So the next step is evaluating the labrum. And you can see there's some fraying here. We will prepare the bone behind the labrum on the rim. If there's a pincer lesion, we'll shave down more like we're doing here. If there's not a pincer lesion, we'll just decorticate, it's called, where we make a healthy bleeding bed, because that's where we're gonna place our anchors. So the next video here will show um, basically anchor placement. So it's a small drill, the anchor gets punched in and we use this bird beak type device to pass the suture through the tear. And then we'll loop it around as you can see in these still pictures and tie that labrum down. So on this next slide, there's a succession of a small single ankle labral tear. So we can see again, a little bruising here, but if you look on the top right picture, there's a, a flap that's separated. So the suture goes through and then we pass it twice through and then we tie it in the back. So you can see how it pinches the labrum to get it nicely up on top. No damage to the cartilage and that's the labral repair. We want the labrum primarily to act as a suction seal. So when we put the bowel back in the socket, the labrum sits nicely on the cup. And this is a video that, that shows the labrum here with the stitch in it, distracting the hip and then allowing the hip to go back into socket. And you can kind of imagine it creating that suction effect. And that's the primary goal that we want the labrum to accomplish when we're done with the labral repair. So the cam resection is where we take you back out of traction. We let the hip go back in socket and then we prepare and shave down that bump. So this is shaving down the bump with the burr and sometimes I'll put in sutures down here to pull this capsule out of the way so I can see well as I shave it down. So if we show some still pictures, this is what it looks like before where it's flat across or a little bump. And then with shaving, we recontour it to make the ball round again. So when the hip is flexed up in the operating room, we can see that that labrum slides right over and isn't banging into anything anymore. So these are some pictures of the patients that I did. And so, this is a left hip. You can see the extra bump here. And then afterwards, we have that ball perfectly round again. This is a patient that basically had it on the right side. And here's the ending picture where the ball is round. So we get these pictures about a month after, uh, three weeks after surgery, because that's when it feels more comfortable to get your legs in that position again. This is a patient that had large cam lesions on both sides. You can see it on the right and the left. So we did the right, made it nice and round, and then we came back and did the left. So now he's got both sides that are nicely rounded off. The last thing we do before we leave the hip is close that capsule because we don't wanna make the hip unstable. So we put sutures through the capsule that we cut and we close it up just like uh, the pictures show there. So lastly, some other kind of fringe indications. Um, sometimes you get a patient that had a hip arthroscopy in the past somewhere else, and this is one of those patients that was a young, whoops, sorry, a younger patient that had damage to the femoral head from the hip arthroscopy. So because it's not advanced arthritis and we don't want her to have a hip replacement, I was able to use this minced cartilage that is cadaver cartilage and pack those lesions and she did very well. It's not her own cartilage, but that will flatten out and turn into kind of a scar cartilage over the top. The number one reason is leaving a bump behind. So this patient had a bump left behind. So we shaved that down appropriately. So it was scooped out. Um, sometimes the labrum is completely deficient or gone and you can do a labral reconstruction where you use cadaver tissue to reconstruct the labrum. So the outcomes tend to be very good when you select your patients appropriately. Somebody with a lot of hip arthritis or dysplasia is not the patient, but we typically have excellent outcomes if you select your patients appropriately. And again, the most common is the impingement or the labral tear. Postoperatively, this is a outpatient surgery. Typically I keep you on crutches with partial and progressive weight bearing over two to three weeks. Physical therapy will start the first week after surgery. Um, usually I see in the office about four or five days after surgery and then we'll start therapy. If you are somebody that's an athlete or getting back to a running type activities, we don't let you return to those activities for about three to four months. 
And then a full return to unrestricted sports is typically about five to six months. But again, once you're off of the crutches, you're typically walking normally. And most people feel pretty good by about three to four weeks uh, walking normally and typically without much discomfort or pain. So I'd like to thank you for your time. Um, any questions are certainly welcome at this point um, for anybody that would like to uh, discuss anything. Go ahead, Tiffany. Thank you. Do you see, seeing as I've already had that procedure done in the right side, do you see any patients that have a reoccurrence happen prior to? My fear is that I'm starting to feel the same pain that I had prior to surgery a few years later now, and I'm fearing having to have it done again and I'm of course only 50, so the chances of having a full hip replacement um, are not great. They don't you know, like to do that, as you know. Um, so do you have right. any? <laughs> yeah, no, of course. So obviously without having seen your x-rays before, and again, hopefully whoever did the hip arthroscopy made sure you didn't have any advanced arthritis, which I'm sure you didn't, but undoubtedly, even though 45 is pretty young, there's probably still some baseline mild cartilage changes in that hip. And if you came in and we looked at it, we would get some x-rays and we would see if there has been a progression of the arthritis. Um, like I talked about the number one in the literature, the number one case for revision surgery is somebody not taking down the bump all the way and you still get impingement and you still get labral tear. So we would get all these x-rays I talked about and see if there's any remaining bump that's causing impingement, see if uh, you've developed any arthritic changes, and then see if there's anything to consider that can, again, prolong that hip or preserve that hip as much as possible. But yes, there's definitely options, um, but it would start with kind of examining and seeing what your hip looks like. Okay, thank you. Mm-hmm. So why do you think that in all orthopedists don't just do the done, um, what was it, the done angle in the x-rays? Like, why wouldn't everyone just do that as soon as you have to get an x-ray? Um, it's not your classic set of hip x-rays. And if you're a 75-year-old coming in for hip pain, it's not the, it's a harder position to get into and it's not necessary because even if they have a cam lesion, if they're arthritic, you just need to know that they have advanced arthritis. And then the only surgical treatment at that point would be to consider replacing the hip. Um, so it really is a special view for those of us that do a lot of hip arthroscopy. Um, it's not a view that would be employed in the emergency room because they're ruling out emergencies um, your primary care doctor would just send you to get basic hip x-rays. So sometimes I do need to repeat the x-rays or at least get that one so I can see what is necessary. Um, in 20, 30 years, if hip arthroscopy continues to become more prevalent, um, a lot, maybe they will be done more routinely. Um, but for now, it's kind of in the situation of, yes, I do hip arthroscopy and this is the best x-ray to get. Okay. Yeah, and I guess for anybody um, going into this, don't be discouraged if you are on crutches for like seven weeks, because I was on crutches for about seven weeks and nothing went wrong. It was all good. So I don't want anyone else to be discouraged about that. Um, and I'm about five months out now and I'm starting the, the running program. So the physical therapist has me working on that. Um, so far, so good. So great work. <laughs> Yeah. yeah, and everything's everything's a range. Um, so yeah. again, some patients Huge may get range. off of crutches at three weeks. But when I put numbers down, it's regardless how you're doing, that's the minimum time I want you to be on crutches. But yeah, I mean, sometimes it makes sense to keep them a little longer. Um, sometimes it makes sense to take a little longer time before you run or before you get back to sports. And there is no problem as long as you continue to progress. Yeah, and I also noticed... Um, Definitely, I would say the hip pain after surgery was pretty low for me personally. I know that's a huge range too, but 
more than anything, it was the back pain, I think for maybe having the legs distracted. And once I got, got over that in like the first week or two, I was in pretty good shape. Like um, that might be too much information for everybody in the room, but basically I didn't want anyone to be discouraged about that because, you know, it's still kind of a step forward. Yeah, I mean, sometimes just using crutches can cause patients to have back pain or shoulder pain, and you're changing how you move and changing how you position yourself, and you're sleeping differently, or you can't get on your stomach. So, I mean, certainly surgery is surgery, and so there's going to be some things that you'll have to kind of get through for the first day or two, but a lot of time the pain after arthroscopic surgery is not unbearable. Um, You have some specific medicines that I send you home with for pain control, as well as uh, prevention of heterotopic ossification, extra bone, DVT prophylaxis, all that kind of stuff. May I put an input? (laughs) Oh, yes, absolutely. Go ahead, Laura. Thank you. Um, I was just going to say that my pain actually immediately after surgery was so much better than prior to surgery. I don't know if it was just like, because all, all of my pain from my hip was in my back. And almost immediately after surgery, it was significantly less. And I didn't even have to use the medication that was prescribed to me. Um, I also went with crutches, I had back pain as well, but I was able to work that out with physical therapy. And it, it, I've been doing really well. I'm actually a month from going back to running and I'm super excited because I'm a runner, so. <laughs> Excellent, thank you for sharing. Yeah, the uh, sometimes, I mean, we don't, I don't tell patients that their pain will go ma- immediately away because obviously you have surgery, but there are times where I feel like pain goes away quicker. And some of those are where patients have that big bump. And just by resecting that big bump, they notice the difference more quickly than others might. Um, And so that's great. I mean, we always try to get patients off of pain medicine as quickly as possible. And some patients come in uh, like you, Laura, and, uh, I didn't have to take much, um, and so that's wonderful, and we, we love to hear that. Yeah, I want to second that also. I, I mean, I was only on pain pills for one to two days after my hip surgery, and the pain, t- the pain of the hip was completely gone. It was the pain of the surgery, which was very minimal, like you were saying. Um, I was on crutches for two months, um, no weight bearing at all, so but I didn't have any pain from the hip itself and medication after one or two days was done. Excellent. Yeah, we obviously with hip arthroscopy being relatively new and by that, I mean, still prevalent for the last 10 years, but like knee arthroscopy and shoulder arthroscopy that have been around for 50, 60 years, some of the protocols do change. And so we found that partial weight bearing is actually safer for the hip and less strenuous on the hip. So I always start my patients day one with at least 25% weight bearing. And so you want to promote the normal kind of heel to toe walking with the crutches. You use the crutches to prevent excessive weight bearing and kind of excessive rotation. um, But at least letting the foot touch the ground kind of takes some of the pressure off the hip. Larry, go ahead and you can unmute and ask your question there or share. Okay. Um, I just had two quick questions. Um, one is because I'm, I'm hearing some different time frames on crutches. So my first question would be like, if, if pain's not there, what makes that determination um, of how long you would stay? And then the other one, just we've talked a lot about, <clears throat> or you know, you talked a lot about like growing, growing area pain, but And obviously my x-rays and MRI show what we've been talking about, but a lot of my pain feels closer to like the outside of my hip. Um, Is that common? So, yes, Larry, you can have some lateral hip pain. Um, Sometimes that primarily is exacerbated or continued because of what's going on in your hip. And That's, I mentioned that a little bit earlier that sometimes you end up getting bursal injections and they just don't help and the pain comes back. 
And we found that because of what's going on inside the hip, it kind of promotes those tissues from not really healing. Because a lot of the stuff on the side is overuse pain, tendonitis, bursitis. But if you can't get rid of that type of pain, then we always will take a closer look inside the hip to make sure that that's not the pain generator or the cause of the problem. Um, and then in terms of crutches, the minimum that I want people on crutches is two to three weeks. But if you're progressing well and doing great in physical therapy and having no pain and you can walk without a limp, you will be off of crutches in two to three weeks. Um, that's the typical protocol now. And that's the typical protocol for most of us that do high volume hip arthroscopy. So um, that should be the case. Now, obviously, if you were late to get into therapy or you're a little slower to kind of get your pain down, maybe you'll be on crutches a little bit longer. But nowadays, if you're doing well, you'll be off the crutches within two to three weeks. Perfect. Thank you. Right, awesome. Were there any other questions or comments here tonight for Dr. Fortune? Happy to answer those. Well, if not, we do thank you all for joining tonight. We really appreciate the, the questions and uh, things that you've shared tonight about your procedures if you've had it. Thank you, Dr. Fortune, as always, for sharing your expertise on all of these subjects. You definitely are the subject matter expert for sure, and we appreciate you. Um, and we hope that you all have a great night. And we, like I said, we'll be sharing this on our website and you'll be able to view that. Likely it'll be up in the next couple of weeks or so. So have a great evening, everyone.